in this place and glad that you have invited us into your place. Hey, you probably noticed on the way in today that the blood mobile is out there. And um, if you have the energy and the strength and good blood, right? Uh, if you want to find out if you've got good blood, that's a good way to, to find that out as well. But they are in need and they are here. And um, as an added bonus, today only, you also get a t-shirt. Yeah, so if, you're, if you need another t-shirt and um, are willing to give blood for it, then you too can earn a t-shirt today and a mask. So it, it just gets better and better. No, honestly, I mean, seriously, we, there, there is a lot of need in Lee County for blood right now. And so if you would, would please just consider it, don't need an appointment, just sort of a walk-in. If you'd like to make an appointment, you can also do that out there. So um, appreciate that. Hey, next Sunday at 11.45, I'm sorry, at 10.45, everybody say 10.45. 1045. 1045. Uh, if you're a member of New Hope, and even if you're not, we're, we're asking you to come to a very, very brief congregational meeting. Now, we're only going to be talking about one thing, and that is, everybody say nominations. Nominations. You're going to hear that like 50 times in the next minute, so keep that in mind. We are not electing elders, deacons, and a trustee next week. What we are electing as a congregation is a nominations team to nominate elders, deacons, and trustee. Okay? So we're not actually electing officers. We're electing the people to come back to us to tell, to nominate those who will become officers of the church. Everybody got that? If you don't, that's fine. Just be here next week at 1045. Now, there's five people that the, that the session, the elders, have already recommended to you, nominated to you to nominate. Again, I told you we're going to use that word a lot. That is Dave Carpenter, Bill Inslin, Candy Engelman, she is one of our um, deacons, Al Kaysen, he also is one of our deacons, and Mike Strand. So those five will come as nominees to this committee already from the session. You, as a congregation, you can choose to elect them or not. And then there will also be the opportunity to, to nominate from the floor three others. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is that if you feel like that you know someone who would be good on that team, um, you need to approach them this week and say, hey, are you willing? And they can pray about it and say, yeah, I, I think I'd be willing to do that. You need, they need to know that. They need to agree to that before you nominate them from the floor. Does that make sense? That's, sometimes we're very Presbyterian, and this is one of those times. So the main thing to remember is next Sunday morning at 1045, right in here, we will have a short congregational meeting to elect a nominating committee to nominate future officers. Wow. Did I make that confusing? I needed an overhead for that. We needed like a whole chart, whole structural chart there. So with that said, uh, focus your attention on the screens, and then we'll begin our worship service today. Good morning, and welcome to worship at New Hope Presbyterian. We're glad to have you. I want to go ahead and invite you to a very exciting event for women that is happening on Saturday, September 25th, right here on campus. We're one of the host sites for the Priscilla Shire Going Beyond Simulcast. It'll be a day full of dynamic teaching, biblical instruction, worship, and fellowship opportunities for women of all ages from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tickets are only $20, and you can purchase them via our website or using the QR code that you see on the chair in front of you or on the screen. That QR code also allows you to sign in on our friendship pad and sign any prayer request. It allows you to continue giving generously to God's kingdom, or you're welcome to mail a paper check or drop a check in one of the white boxes in the lobby as you exit today. We're very excited to have our new part-time transitional pastor, Ben Borsay, with us to bring the message today. We're very happy you're with us. Well, good morning, New Hope. It's good to see you this morning. Why don't you stand up on your feet? We're going to worship the Lord together. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's sing. I give you glory.
be together to worship. We need this. We need this time of worship and community together. Amen. Um, I want to read out of uh, Philippians some of our my favorite passages of the scripture say, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding here on earth, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know, um, a few years ago, my sister, her best friend, her college roommate, um, they were thick as thieves, was diagnosed with cancer. And it was devastating. And she lost her battle at the young age of 24. And on this side of heaven, we don't understand that. But she knew Jesus. And through the battle, even with a promising future ahead of her, she was just about to graduate from an orthotics program and become a doctor. And, and she just had the joy of the Lord in her life. But this was a devastating time for her. She raised a hallelujah to the Lord through her battle. And I sat at her service, and I watched her parents on the front row. And I have two teenage daughters, and I just cannot imagine. But I watched them raise their hands to the Lord days after she passed. Because the battle belongs to the Lord, right? We can fix our eyes on Jesus no matter what we're walking through. He is the God of the mountain, and He is the God of the valley. So in a room this size, I'm sure someone in here is walking through something difficult. Maybe a cancer battle, maybe a relational battle, maybe a financial struggle. But today we can choose our faith to put our faith into action. Our faith is the things that we hope for. It's the evidence of things not seen. So let's raise a hallelujah today and believe that he's going to do what only he can do. Amen. Come on.
not just that God showed his love by sending his son to die but that his son was raised again for new life for you and for me and for all who trust in him let's join together sing the gospel of what he's done for us
Gracious God, you alone are worthy to receive all honor and glory and power and praise forever and ever and ever. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we will be in your presence, where there'll be no more tears, no more crying, only full joy in the presence of your beauty, in the glory of your majesty, surrounded by the saints. And so, Father, thank you for the image, for the picture, for the promise that you give us. And, Father, we pray that you would use us to proclaim the way, the truth, the life of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Empower your church, Lord, to take with boldness the only name that is worthy to receive all honor. The only name that is worthy to receive all power. The only name that is worthy to open the seals. The only truly trustworthy God, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask that you would receive and, and inhabit the praises of your people gathered here. May we be changed because we have been in your presence. Now open your word to us that we may feast in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, if you have been enjoying some of those cooler temperatures earlier this week, did everybody enjoy that? Maybe not the rain, but the cool temperatures. That was nice, wasn't it? Some folks would say that was because of Hurricane Larry going by. I choose to believe something very different. I believe that was a gift brought to us by our part-time transitional pastor and his wife, Kathy, who came down from Findlay, Ohio, and brought some of that Ohio fall with them. And so we are blessed to have them with us this weekend. They'll be back um, pretty much full-time, part-time, in other words, here all the time, um, be, ben will be here about 25 hours a week working with us. Um, he's going to be just such a blessing. Uh, ben has been in ministry for almost 40 years. He spent 36 years at a church in Findlay, Ohio. And by God's grace, and I'm sure as we get to know them more, we'll hear more of the story, but by God's grace, it went from a fairly small rural church over those years, God kept growing and growing and growing to where it became a, a regional um, center of the gospel and even one of the larger and more influential churches in our denomination. And so we are anxious to get that kind of experience and that kind of perspective as we look forward to what the Lord is going to be doing here at New Hope. Uh, ben is a graduate of West Virginia University. What is that? Go the what? Mountaineers? Is that the Mountaineers? I, I knew that. Yeah, go Mountaineers, right? Um, he graduated there with an undergrad degree and also a degree in law. And so he um, st when, was at law school, felt like that wasn't what the Lord had for him. Um, I'll, again, I'll let him tell the story someday. He and Kathy tell the story, but ended up going to Princeton Theological Seminary for his Master's of Divinity, and then later on to 
Belhaven, no, Weinbrenner. I could remember that, I'm sorry, Weinbrenner, um, for his doctor of ministry where he's also taught several classes on, on preaching and other church-related things. Uh, like I said, he's gonna be coming here beginning in November, but this weekend he and Kathy are down just sort of getting their feet on the ground, seeing, seeing what they've agreed to. So thank you for your stepping out in faith. It's pretty, did, did any waters part open as you got here? Thank you so much for coming and bringing the word for us, Ben. God bless. When you bring your tithes and your offerings to this storehouse, I want you to be aware of the way that the Lord uses that. Um, this past week, we've had the opportunity to give very generously to um, boots on the ground in Afghanistan. Pioneers are over there working to bring relief. We, we hear about the military issues, the the political issues, all those kind of things, but there are real people that don't have power, that don't have water, that don't have food because the whole country is upside down. We've been able to channel some resources there to help them. We've been able to channel some other resources to Haiti where uh, Samaritan's Purse is on the ground there and so we're able to bring the hope, not only of the gospel, but the, the, the blessings of the boots of the church there as well. We've also been able to give in the past week up to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi and Louisiana as they're recovering from the latest hurricane up there. So when you give, recognize that your gift goes around the world as you bring your tithes to the storehouse and your offerings as well. Four ways you can do that. I won't remind you of that because um, I don't remember them, but I know that one of them's online. You can open up your, your phone and grab it there. There's boxes out there and there's a couple other ways too. But thank you for your faithful giving. God bless. Ben, thank you so much. That'll be my way. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just figuring all this out, including the, the clicker. I've never used a clicker. First service, uh, it was a bit of a disaster, but we, we don't need to talk about what happened. Um, uh, good morning, and again, uh, thank you, Mike, and others who have helped make this uh, visit very enjoyable. We've learned a lot about Fort Myers. We've learned about you. And we are very excited about coming alongside and doing ministry together uh, in this corner of God's uh, kingdom. Now, just a note about uh, Pastor Mike, um, getting to know him, learning about him. He is indeed the Energizer Rabbit. Uh, he has more energy, and that's good because he's been doing an awful lot, and you know that. He's doing what usually in many churches three pastors have to do, uh, so he is Pretty amazing, hard to keep up with him, uh, but what a blessing uh, to New Hope that he has for you. Uh, uh, a great, great leader. Let me give you a little more background to uh, Kathy, and Kathy is in the front row. You can raise a hand, Kathy. Uh, we... We've been married for 44 years. We have three kids, nine uh, grandchildren. We um, come from a town called Finley, Finley, Ohio. Uh, just <laughs> now, who knows about Finley? I guess there's one hand going up. A couple other people have heard of it. Uh, it's north of Dayton, south of Toledo. Uh, 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 and, yeah, rockets, too. The rock. One thing that Finley's famous for, uh, it's the hometown of a guy named Ben Roethlisberger. Uh, now, it depends on how you feel about the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, he's, been, <laughs> he's been their quarterback for a number of years, and you may say, well, so that, that would make you a Steelers fan. Well, I was a Steelers fan even before then, because when I was a kid, we lived in the Pittsburgh area, and so I was cheering for the Steelers when they were... Uh, a very pathetic football team, so I, I've been cheering for them for years. Uh, there are other pro teams I like, but I'm more a college football kind of guy. West Virginia University, the Mountaineers. Uh, two of uh, our kids, our two boys, went to Ohio State. Uh, so we are Buckeye fans, <laughs> uh, and we cheer, we cheer for the Buckeyes, uh, other Big Ten and Midwest kind of teams. There's a team up in Ann Arbor we don't even talk about. 
<laughs> and we are, uh, we're not new to Florida. When we began ministry at seminary, we were part of a church in Pompano Beach, Florida, a church that was then called, they, they may still call it, the Big Pink. It's a large cathedral-like church, pink, uh, typical Florida, uh, and we were on staff there for a while before we moved on to Finley. And over the years, we've different times been in Florida. Recent years, we've been spending part of our winters uh, up in Sarasota. So we're, we're familiar with, with the area, and we know some folks in the church. Uh, first service, uh, Bob Welch and his wife were here, and Bob and I uh, serve on a national committee called Generosity Resources. And, and a number of years ago when I began working with him, uh, he began bragging about his home church. Uh, he even invited me to come and preach. I, I don't know if the pastors knew he was doing that, uh, but he invited me, why don't you come on down and preach for us sometime? Um, and that, that did not materialize. And then I got a call uh, that here's a church that could use me to come alongside and help with some things. And I said, wow, that, that's Bob's church. So um, Bob finally got me down here to preach. Uh, and he, I, I know Bob and his wife and, again, uh, different people in the church. And we will get to know more of you. Uh, it, it's exciting. We're at an exciting place in our lives. And I know it's an exciting place for you as a church. Now, this morning, I want to talk about prayer that makes a difference. Uh, before we look at some scripture as we consider the subject, let's, let's take a moment and bow our heads and our hearts. Father God, we want to thank you that on this day you have brought us together to worship you, that our worship is always uh, Jesus-centered. He is the living word, and we thank you that we can get closer to him through the written word that is the Bible. We pray now that as we open your word and seek your truth, that your Holy Spirit would be teaching so that we're becoming more and more like your son, the one who is Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, we pray. Uh, to get into the subject, let me, let me ask you a personal question, and that would be, how is your prayer life? Now, to help you think about it, think of a scale, one to ten. One being, and this may describe you, a guy who last Thanksgiving was asked by his wife, uh, the family's together, we're ready to eat, you, you say the prayer, and you said the prayer, and that was the last time you prayed. That, that's a typical one. A ten would be someone, and maybe you're like this, who's already prayed a couple of hours before coming here. You'll pray several more hours today. Five to six is a standard day. When things are really pressing, you would pray even more. And so the question again would be, what is your prayer life like? Um, the uh, theologian, uh, D.A. Carson, says, if you want to embarrass the average Christian ask them to tell you the details of their personal prayer life. And right now, some of you may be thinking, did someone tell you, Pastor Ben, that this is a church where people just don't pray enough and you need, you need that message that exhorts them to uh, become more uh, effective and more de determined to pray? Well, actually, it's a message for all of us. I, I know for me, as I was constructing the sermon, I kept thinking, man, I really need to hear this. Uh, and you're going to hear me preach, and what you're hearing is the pastor preaching to himself, because like all of us, we need to pray more. But why do we not pray more? Uh, there are different reasons. Uh, one reason would be the idea that I'm too busy. Now, before I retired, I thought, well, when I retire, I'll have more time to pray, to study the scripture, do other really good things. And then I retired and, and I discovered that I am just as busy, if not more busy. And some of you can relate to that and say, yeah, well, I thought retirement was going to be different, but my life's even more crazy and hectic than it was before. And so people, uh, whether you're 19 uh, or 79 or 99, you can say, uh, I'm just too busy to pray. Some people may feel that life is good. I was in a store the other day, and there was an array of hats and caps, different insignias and colors, but they all had in common uh, the words, life is good. And you may be that person. You may say, you know, life's good. If things go bad, I know I can pray, and we'll do prayer when things fall apart. 
There are others, and you may be one, for whom your prayer experience has been painful. That's because of unanswered prayer. Uh, you may have prayed and prayed and prayed and your loved one still passed away. You may have prayed for your marriage, for reconciliation, for a new day for, for you and your spouse uh, and your husband never came back. It, it may have been a business. Uh, your, your dreams were invested in a business and, and then things went bad and things got worse and you were praying uh, and the business collapsed. There went your dream. Uh, your disappointment in prayer may have things, have to, may relate to health issues, to things in school, relationships, or, or church life. Uh, some of you in your past may have been part of a church uh, where things just got really bad. Uh, there were bad things going on. You were praying and you were fervent and you were crying out to the Lord and it never got any better. And so you have this experience in your life of unanswered prayer. It's kind of hard for you to get into prayer. And for all of us in different ways, all the categories I've mentioned, many others, uh, there, there's this big question, does prayer make any difference? And you may feel that way and say, I love the Lord. Uh, Jesus is my Savior. I'm cool with that. I go to church. I do the things I'm supposed to do. But does it really make any difference? I mean, God, God's already decided what he's going to do. He's going to take care of his business and why do I need to pray? Well, if you read scripture from beginning to end, you're going to see God uh, speaking to his people and, and again and again, ch commanding and challenging them to pray. And the passages we look at today, you're going to hear words uh, that come from Luke 18, verse 1. Jesus telling his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. All right, let's look at our passages. Luke 11 is where we're going to begin, verse 5. Um, two passages that for some of you are very familiar. Uh, we begin verse 5. Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you uh, has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I, I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend. Yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now, the next passage comes from Luke uh, chapter 18, uh, beginning in verse 1. We read... Um, I need to move on here, Some stuff I'm learning about. Well, I'll read the Luke 18. I kind of shot ahead of myself, but that's okay. Uh, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men, and there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she will not eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, we're going to be looking at several things about prayer, but let me address a couple of things that come out of these verses. And the first one, and this is really important, uh, to note that he is speaking to disciples. If you go back and get the context of both of the passages we've looked at, uh, he has called aside his disciples for a unique teaching. This is not a teaching for everybody. He, it's not other places in Scripture where we read a big crowd was there. Uh, the Pharisees were there. Uh, all sorts of people. No, he pulls his disciples apart and, and tells them something about that which is prayer. This is really important because we live in an age where a lot of people assume that if you just count, you're a nice person, you say 
things uh, aimed at heaven that God upstairs will answer prayer. There is nothing in Scripture that would tell us that God is going to answer the prayer of unbelievers. Now, he can. He's a gracious God. He can do whatever he wants to do. Uh, he can respond to all sorts of prayers. In your life, your experience may have been before you were a believer, you were crying out, and God answered it in a miraculous way. But, the, but there's no guarantee. There's no promise. The promises about prayer are always attached to those who belong to him, those who place their, their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior alone, those who would be his disciples. He makes the promise of, and, of that which is answered prayer. Uh, important to note that. The other one is uh, trying to answer the question of why is he repeating this teaching twice? It, it, you know, in Luke, you, you read it about the, uh, the, the neighbor who wants the bread. You read, it, read about the widow, basically the same theme. Why does he do it twice? I think straightforward would be the truth that disciples then and now need to be reminded to pray always and never give now, we're going to be looking at several things that are gleanings from the Scripture we're looking at. These are gleanings really from other parts of the Scripture as well. Uh, these are great big truths in God's economy. And the first thing we're going to be looking at is the truth that we are to pray helpless. Now, the two characters are in a helpless place. Uh, the first being the guy who has a visitor at night. Uh, he doesn't have food in that first century a setting, it was the epitome of, of cultural misbehavior if you did not take care of your guests, if you didn't provide provision. And so that, that, that's the first problem he has. He doesn't have food. And the second problem related to that is there's nowhere to really go. You, you don't just drive down the street and, and go to an all-night convenience store. That was not the reality of the first century. Everything was shut down, including the neighbor's house, and you didn't go knocking on neighbor's doors at midnight. Everyone was in their house. Things were locked up. That was a, also a cultural no-no, but he has to go somewhere, and so he's beating on the door, and, and the neighbor, who is his friend, doesn't even want to help him. And so he has to keep beating on the door and crying for help. His situation was helpless. The widow's situation was helpless because in the ancient world, a widow had no rights, uh, usually limited resources. The judges were notoriously corrupt. Uh, oftentimes they made their real living taking bribes. She had already been judged against, and she's, she's begging for um, a, a right call from the judge. She is in a helpless place. Uh, Ole Helsby is a Norwegian uh, theologian, and, and he settles on that word helplessness as the best summary of the heart attitude that God accepts as prayer. Let, let me quote, uh, whether it takes the form of words or not does not mean anything to God, only to ourselves, he adds, only he who is helpless can truly pray. Uh, another writer, Leonard Ravenhill, says, God does not answer prayer. God answers desperate prayer. Now, you see these things, you hear this. Our, our natural response, mine for sure, is I, I don't really like that. I don't like the idea of being, uh, being helpless. Uh, we are, as a people, uh, of a mindset that I, I can do it. Uh, I want to take care of this myself. I don't want to be helpless. Some would say, well, that's, that's kind of an American thing, isn't it? Anywhere you go in the world, people have that same feeling. I want to take care of this myself. I, I don't want to be helpless. I remember years ago listening to a, a motivational speaker who had been a, a school teacher. And he said one of the things he always did with his students was to write up on a chalkboard the phrase, I can't. And then he said, your goal in life is to take an eraser and, and erase the apostrophe. So the words, I can't, becomes, I can. Now, I, I like that. Uh, that's a good, positive, mental attitude. Uh, we can all apply that. We want the people we love to, to think in terms of, I can. But that's not spiritual reality. Spiritual reality is helplessness. The day you became a Christian, 
It was not a transaction between you and God where you said, hey, I've got some flaws, I understand that, but I bring a lot to the table, I have a lot of good assets, I can really add value to the kingdom enterprise that you're doing, and, and you know, if you let me sign up, you and I can do great things. No, you began the Christian life, maybe not singing it, but with, with the, the words of, of the song, just as I am without Anybody remember, without one plea, just as I am without one plea. And I believe that there are many folks uh, who are not going to become believers, although the opportunity has been there, because of this attitude of self-reliance. And the very idea that I have a problem I can't solve just doesn't sit well with them. And so they go through life, maybe even religious, involved in the church, but never willing to humble themselves to the place of saying, just, just as I am. I, I think on the doors of hell, you may see the words self-reliance. Now, many of you would agree and say, Pastor Ben, you're absolutely right. To become a Christian, you know, you need to be broken before the Lord. You need to be helpless. But afterwards, you know, you, you need to roll up your sleeves and get to work. There's a lot to be done. Uh, God doesn't want you just kind of uh, hanging around and being helpless. Helplessness is the whole of the Christian life. Uh, Jesus said, and this is John 15, uh, 5, uh, apart from me, you can do nothing. The whole of the Christian life, we keep coming back to the Lord and saying, I can't do it. I can't figure this out. I can't make my marriage any better. I can't do the things for my kids that I think need to be done. I, I, I need your help. I am helpless. And that's the prayer that God is answering. Uh, secondly, not only that we pray helpless, but that we pray big. Uh, both characters are coming to their neighbor, to the judge, asking something big. Uh, the neighbor who doesn't have food, uh, it's not just you know, three loaves of Wonder Bread or something. He's asking for bread in, in a world where the bread would have been large, enough to feed a family. He's asking for three loaves of bread. Uh, we're told he had one person coming to visit him. I mean, it's maybe kind of overboard, but he's, he's asking big. Uh, and of course, all the hurdles that he had to cross to even get there to receive the bread. The widow is asking that a corrupt judge, and we're told that he didn't really care about God or people, that she's asking this corrupt judge to overturn his own previous decision. They're both praying big. Now, this is a juncture where we need to be careful and realize that Jesus is not saying that God is like that neighbor or that judge. God is better. Think about it. Um, here comes um, the woman approaching the judge as a stranger, not as one of his beloved children. She is coming to the one who is, if we think of in spiritual terms, uh, the king of the universe. You and I in our prayers are coming to the one uh, who got out of his throne. Uh, emptied himself of, all, of everything that was his royal prerogative, came into our world, lived a life that you and I could never live, died a death you and I could never die. He died re representing us on that cross, and because of what happened on that cross, because of his shed blood, he's able to say, justice has been realized. Your, your sins have been taken care of. Boy, that's a much, much greater than the judge we see here in the story. That's our God. Or, or, or think, of a, think of the guy who's looking for the bread. Uh, our, our God doesn't just give us bread. He, he is the bread of life. He gives us his life. He gives us everything we need for this life, the life to come. It's life eternal, life abundant. It's an overflow. It's, a, it's an embarrassment of, of, of gifts coming from our gracious and loving Father. One of my favorite verses in Scripture uh, would be the verses in Romans 8.32 where we read, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Now, that verse can be a banner over your prayer life. You're coming to the God 
who gave up his son. Why can't you pray big? You, gave, you, you did something that is absolutely ama- amazing and unbelievable. And so I come to you, and, and here's my request. And you can pray big because of what our God has done for you and me. Um, there, there, there's a wonderful story from the life of Alexander the Great. Uh, after Alexander the Great had uh, conquered uh, most of the uh, ancient world, he um, was, it was at the pinnacle of, of power. And, and, and one day, one of his generals came to talk to him, m- making a request. And the general said, um, Alexander, w- will you please pay for my daughter's wedding? Alexander thought about it for a moment and then said, I'll pay for it. Just go see my treasure, tell him how much you need, he'll give you the money. Well, a few days later, the, the treasurer came back and said to Alexander, you need to arrest that general. Uh, you need to punish him. He's taking advantage of you. He's asking money uh, to pay for the greatest, most enormous uh, wedding in the history of humankind. Alexander thought about it for a moment and said, well, no, just give him whatever he needs. You see, when he came to me, he paid me the, the, the two greatest compliments. First of all, when he came and asked, he, he was saying, uh, I believe that you are wealthy enough to pay for my daughter's wedding. And he was also complimenting me by saying, and I also believe that you are generous enough. <laughs> Think about that. When you go to God, you're, you're, you're confessing a, a belief that he is indeed wealthy enough. All the resources of the universe belong to him. And you're also saying, and I believe that you are generous enough, that you are the God whose grace has been poured out and will be poured out, and you will answer my prayers. We pray helpless, we pray big, we also pray simple. Uh, in, this, in the passage we've looked at, it's a really simple request, three loaves of bread and justice for my case. We're to pray simple. Jesus said, and this um, uh, you, you see in Matthew 6, 7, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think will, they will be heard because of their many words. Uh, in the ancient world, there was an idea that uh, if uh, you're going to one of the gods, and there are many gods for the Greeks and the Romans and the people in the Mediterranean uh, community, and they go to a god, and the conviction was that if you have a lot of words, and you spend a lot of time praying, and you make a big show of your prayers, then uh, the, the God that you're praying to will maybe answer your prayer. Now, the Jewish people had begun to adopt some of that and, and brought it into their approach to God. So Jesus is slamming the Gentiles, the unbelievers, the pagans, but he's also hitting on some of the religious leaders by saying, yeah, don't be like a like a pagan who, who thinks they've got to say a lot of words if gods are going to listen to them. You see, what, what, the, what people were really doing was saying that, that when it comes to prayer, it, it's a works proposition. You really got to work hard to get God to listen to you because he's not going to pay attention if you just say, God, I need your help. I mean, you've you got to really pray long, hard prayers. But our God is the God of grace. He comes to us graciously. Now, that doesn't mean you don't use words. That doesn't mean that there doesn't need to be uh, a prayer language when you're going to him. But the truth of the matter is that God is a gracious God. You don't have to convince him of anything when you come to him in prayer. Simple also means definite. Uh, I like the word specificity, uh, that you pray in specific terms. Now, imagine... You have, a, a, let's say, a daughter or a granddaughter heading off to college, and you're praying for her, and, and your prayer would be, oh, God, help them uh, find some friends and, and do well in school and keep them safe and healthy and uh, all those good things. Well, that's not a wrong prayer, but why not pray with specificity? Why not pray, oh, Lord, I, I pray that my granddaughter uh, will meet Christians right away, 
that my granddaughter will connect with a Christian group on campus, that my granddaughter will find a good church, that she'll keep reading the Bible, that she'll keep praying. You see, that's a prayer with specificity. Uh, That's simple and that's definite. And and we don't, you know, we're sometimes uncomfortable with that because uh, the fear of exposure. That somehow, if people hear us praying like that and things don't turn out like we're praying, they're going to say, ha! So much for you and your relationship with God, or so much for the God you believe in. And that's the other part of fear of exposure, is that we're afraid that somehow God's going to be exposed, that he's not as big as we think he is. So we'll make the prayer real general. And if we're general, well, you can always say God answered the prayer, right? Pray simple, and that includes specificity. And then pray persistently. Um, the, the main point uh, in the scripture we're looking at uh, would seem to be this idea of persistent prayer. Uh, Luke uh, 18, verse 1, uh, in the, the parable that Jesus taught, he says um, that they should always pray and not give up. That's persistent prayer. I, I saw the story the other day about a woman named Helen Mullenkoff, uh, who in 1922... As a young woman, uh, she went to a missionary conference in New Jersey. Now, the people who were uh, hosting the conference were uh, the folks who would eventually form what is today the Wycliffe Bible Translators. And they were talking about a heart that they had for Mexico. And they said, if God's speaking to you and he's laying a burden on you to be praying uh, with us for these ministries, come on up afterwards and we'll give you a piece of paper on which will be the, the name of a tribe. And we're going to ask you to be, hold on to that and keep praying uh, that the word of God would be translated into the language of these people. So she came up and she took a piece of paper and on it was written Mazahua. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and she would live her life uh, go to college, she became a nurse, spent a number of years even working as a nurse missionary. Uh, After her career, she retired, uh, moved to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and there uh, she continued praying for the Mazahua and actually prayed for that translation for 48 years. Uh, Then one day she was reading that that the Bible had been translated into the language of, of these people. Uh, but before she read that, uh, she had this feeling that God was lifting that prayer burden from her, that she didn't need to pray about them anymore. The year was 1970. Uh, then a couple years later, she's reading about the work and how it was successful. So she contacted those missionaries, and a couple representatives of that missionary group came to see her. And they brought to her in her retirement years a, um, a translation of the New Testament into the language of the Mazahua people. And that was for her a wonderful gift. And then she asked them, she said, when actually was the Bible translation completed? I remember 1970 is when she felt God saying, you don't need to pray. This is several years down the road. And they tell her, and you know where the story is going, they say to her, 1970. Wow, 48 years. Uh, There may be something you've been praying about for uh, four to eight weeks or 48 months. 48 years may be what you need to pray about. You know, this story uh, spoke to me in a special way. And um, my wife is here in front of me. She's going to take over if I get too emotional um, because here it comes again. The Holy Spirit grabbing my heart. Uh, Because our daughter, uh, her name is Rachel, uh, is a Bible. Translator with husband and kids in Cameroon, Africa. Uh, They're working with a tribe called the Baka. And so I'm going to take advantage of being here in this pulpit and ask you to pray for the Baka people. Uh, for their Bible translation. Uh, It's an easy word to remember, B-A-K-A. And I may never check up with you on it again, and you may be praying about it for a long time, uh, but pray for the Baca. And and I know I can ask you to do that because this is a uh, mission-centered church. You love missions. 
This, uh, you can add it to your mission list to be praying for the Baca. And someday, uh, you may meet our daughter here. She may be visiting us sometime. Uh, as you know, missionaries don't get home that often. Uh, but if you don't meet her here, someday uh, we're all going to meet together and you'll get to hear the rest of that story. What happened to the Baca people? Pray persistently. Pray always. Never give up. And then finally, pray joyfully. And when we talk about praying joyfully, uh, you may say, okay, I didn't really see that in those passages. Well, joyful is a signature all the way through Scripture. We're to rejoice. We're to pray. Uh, You heard uh, our our worship leader talking about that passage in Philippians where we're told to, to, to rejoice. And, and then, if you remember how that goes, the, the verses following that is all about prayer. We are to be people who pray joyfully. And we pray joyfully because of who our God is. Now, I've been following what goes on here at New Hope, um, watching everything on the screen. And you were blessed uh, over a period of several weeks with a wonderful sermon series on uh, Habakkuk. And if you recall... Uh, in Habakkuk, there's some words about that which is joy. By the way, I, I love that series, but the only thing that uh, kind of left me uh, empty uh, was that uh, the, the pastor, Mike, never told us whether it's pronounced Habakkuk or Habakkuk. I, I kept waiting for that answer. But anyhow, um, at the very end of Habakkuk, we read, and I pick it up in verse 17, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. I love that. I I, I will be joyful in God, my Savior. We know him as Savior Jesus. And when we are praying, we're praying confidence, resting on the name of Jesus. That's why we can be joyful in our prayers. You, You may have tears when you're praying, and it may be the most difficult, painful thing you've ever gone through, and you're crying out to the Lord But there ought to be, and this is the work of the Holy Spirit, a sense of of joy. Rejoicing in the one who is our Savior, God. Hold on to all these things. Um, Hopefully this is helpful for you and for me. That we're to pray uh, helpless and to pray big and to pray simple. uh, And to pray persistently and to pray joyfully. Uh, let's, uh, Let's close our time. Uh, bowing our hearts in prayer. Father God, we want to thank you that we have the good news, the good news that has changed our lives forever. Jesus is our Savior and Lord. We pray that as individuals and as a church, uh, we may be faithful in proclaiming that wonderful good news. And we ask, Lord, that you would work in us in a way that we are prayer warriors, praying in ways that makes a difference because our prayers rest on the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. All right. Let me get out of the way here. Let's stand together and join our hearts in the song, but may it be more than just a song, may it be a declaration of our faith and our trust in our sovereign, holy, loving Father. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God.
now may the love of God our Father and the grace of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us today and always. Amen.